Great to be here. Thank you for that nice introduction. I'm glad Brian brought us with him as well <laughs> to Michigan. Yes, but uh, it's wonderful to be here. We've been here seven months. I can hardly believe it. I'm starting to feel a little bit like a Michigander, starting a little bit. It's interesting. Some people will say, you know, what's been the biggest, um, you know, kind of surprise of the transition? And uh, to me, it has been the length of the transition. So I'm a, I'm a raging optimist and off the, parts, uh, off the charts positivity person. And so uh, we have a couple mentor couples in our life and they have relocated multiple times uh, with like corporate moves and stuff. And so a lot of them would say to me, you need to give yourself a year to two years to really feel like you've rooted and transitioned. And me, I'm like, okay, a month or two. I'll be set. I'll be transitioned. And I'm like, okay, no, I, I, under, I definitely understand the needing to root and how it takes time, particularly with um, four kids. I have four daughters, 17, 16, 13, and 11, and they are awesome. So anyway, well, thank you for having me. Um, you have a wonderful insights team. And we are just going to jump right into this, right? So we're in the book of Joshua. And most of you, I'm assuming, know how we got to the book of Joshua. But just in case, we'll do that recap. We have our fathers of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who became Israel. Remember, he wrestled with God through the night, and God gave him the new name Israel. And then Israel is where we get the name, the nation of Israel. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and to Abraham, God gave a promise to start a new nation in this new land, and he was going to be their God, and they were going to be his people. And then Jacob, or Israel, had a son, Joseph. Remember with his Technicolor dream coat that his brothers sold into slavery? He ended up in Egypt, but the famine happened with the rest of the family in Canaan. So they all came to Egypt and lived happily ever after until they died, and 400 years later, they were enslaved. So we have 400 years after Joseph that the people of Israel, the children of Israel, are enslaved under Egypt, and God raises up Moses. Remember, he's in the basket and the Pharaoh's daughter finds him, the prince of Egypt. You can follow all the Disney movies to actually get a little bit of the story here. And Moses comes on the scene, and then Moses is the one who God says, you're going to free my people. And so through the plagues that are sent and through the parting of the Red Sea and God as the cloud by night, by day and the fire by night, God leads the children of Israel from captivity and slavery in Egypt into freedom. All right, so that's where we land now because we're in the book of Joshua and Joshua was Moses' mentee. So Moses has died. Joshua has been raised up as the new leader to go from the wilderness of 40 years where Moses was with the children of Israel into this promised land. And so that's where we pick up in this book. And it's very important sometimes as we read the Old Testament, just recapping a little bit of this, that we always read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. Jesus is the revelation. It is God revealed in the New Testament. So sometimes, you know, we read things in the Old Testament and we're like, mm, the Old Testament doesn't really seem like Jesus. There's not really, mm, how do I hold these two in balance? They seem that they're opposing. They're not opposing. If they ever seem that they're opposing the character of Jesus and what we read about in the Old Testament, it is our understanding or misunderstanding or misinterpretation or misapplication of the Old Testament. Jesus is our default. So everything we read needs to be viewed through the lens of Jesus and what he has revealed about the Father and what he has revealed about his kingdom. And so we read things about wandering through the desert and how God delivers them. Doesn't he do that through our sin? We wander in a world and God delivers us from our sin. And so we begin to see, it's called typology, the, the, the attributes of Jesus being coming out and coming alive in the Old Testament. And that's what we want to look for. But Jesus is always our default as we read the Old Testament. And we also always want to say, ask ourselves this question, what is this story? What is this book? What is it trying to tell me about the character of God? The Bible is God revealing himself to us. And so we need to ask him and ask the Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth 
and reveal the heart of the Father to me. That is what Jesus wants so much for us to know the heart of the Father. And so from the book of Joshua, we've drawn some high-level themes over these last few weeks, right? And I'll just recap a few of these high-level themes. First, the first thing that we see as we read the book of Joshua is that God is ultimately victorious. Victorious over what? Sin, death. He has conquered the grave. And it doesn't maybe seem like that quite yet, right? Because his kingdom is already, but not yet. And upon his coming again, the coming of Christ, all will be redeemed, but we live in that in-between right now. But God, we know the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we cannot see. That's faith, right? We know that God is ultimately victorious. And that's what we read about through these multiple conquests in, in, in Joshua, that God goes before us and he is victorious. Another high-level theme that we pull out of the book of Joshua is that we should expect battles with God's plan. Jesus says, in this world, you will have many troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so you look, I mean, I love how like jo Joshua is commissioned by Moses and boom, he's in battle. Immediately he's sent to war. Immediately he's in battle. Immediately there's conflict. Immediately there's problems. Immediately there's grumbling. Immediately there's idolatry from the people. Problems, 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 problems. When God calls you into something, expect an attack from the enemy. And so we see that. That as we walk in obedience, we should not be surprised. I remember there was a season where we just kept feeling these fiery darts of the enemy in ministry. And I said to Brian one day, I was like, that's it. I'm going to stop being surprised by the attacks of the enemy. Why are we always surprised when things are coming at us and the world is coming at us and we're feeling like all of these fiery darts of the enemy? Oh, well, well you know what? Now I know I'm walking in obedience and I'm not going to be surprised by it anymore. The enemy is after us and we are forging ahead with God because he is victorious. So he's ultimately victorious. Expect your battles. And then I also love about Joshua, and we pick this up a little bit uh, in the book of Exodus as well and his life with uh, Moses. But that Joshua was first on his knees before he was ever on a battlefield. Anointing and authority comes on our knees, not on a stage. It comes through spending time with the Lord if we go back up and we read about Moses' life, you always see that Moses is going in and out of the tent, you know, up and down the mountain, reporting things that God has told him to tell the children of Israel, the law, the Ten Commandments. But you know what it says about Joshua? He remained in the tent. He remained in the presence of God. He was learning. He was taking it all in. Joshua was a mighty leader because he was a mighty prayer warrior. He learned how, you know, everybody wants to be the David, but before David was a king, he learned how to worship alone on the backside of a mountain and love God. He knew the character and the heart of God. And that's why through every battle and through every failing that David had, he ran back to God because he knew his heart and he knew who he was. And that's why David was a man after God's heart because he knew how to worship. He knew how to pray. And so that's what we want to be as well. We want to be those people who battle on our knees before we battle on a field. And then lastly, another high-level theme that we kind of glean from this book of Joshua. And this is a hard one to remember, but it's a good one to remember. And we see this throughout uh, most of Moses' life and Joshua's life as well, is that as we obey God makes a way. As we obey, he makes a way. You know, I think sometimes the world tells us we have to make a way for ourselves. We have to make a name for ourselves. We have to defend ourselves. We have to build up our own reputation. We have to do it. We have to put ourselves out there. That's not what God calls us to do. God calls us to walk in obedience. And as we walk in obedience, God will make a name for us. God will make a way for us. God will reveal the plans for us. And that's what happens to Joshua. 
You know, it's interesting when you see, you guys probably saw this in the first couple chapters, right? It's like Moses passes the baton and boom, Joshua's at war with somebody, right? Battle, all of a sudden. But what happens after that first battle? It says that the leaders saw Joshua as their leader now, that God was with him. And sometimes it takes just stepping out. All right, God, you've called me to lead these people and I've got all these battles ahead of me. But through the battles, God made a reputation for Joshua and he anointed him and revealed to the people that Joshua is going to be their new leader and they followed him because of it. So God will make a way. We don't have to worry about what the world thinks of us. We don't have to climb these ladders of success and try to make our own accolades so that, you know, we're defending everything that we need to do. No, 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 no. We just need to obey. We need to walk in what God has called us to do. And God will clear the path. He will make straight the path before us, as scripture says. So those are some of the high level themes. So we're going to jump into Joshua 9 and 10. Are you guys ready? All right, here we go. So setting the little scene. They battled, Right? So all of, all, of, all of Joshua is fighting, just so you know. Um, most of it, most, almost all of it is fighting. So they're battling, they're battling. So they come across a very strategic city filled with the Gibeonite people. Now what's happened at this point is all of the cities in their paths ahead, it says they're melting in fear because of the Israelites. The Israelites have total victory. And the surrounding nations they know don't have a chance because the Israelites are just conquering place after place after place because God is victorious, right? And the amazing thing about this is they're so fearful because you see gods back then were considered, they were confined to people. So each people group had their own God or they were confined to something, the God of the sun, the God of the Nile, the God of the insects, the God of the crops, the God of fertility. And so they were gods that were confined by something, but the Israel's God was not confined. Israel's God would go into other countries and defeat their gods. Israel's God would go before them and make a way. Wherever they were, whatever they did, their strategies were different all the time. This God was unpredictable. And so all of a sudden, the other nations are trembling because they don't know what to do because this God seems unstoppable. Isn't he? Yeah, he's unstoppable. So the Gibeonites are like, all right, we got to do something about this because the Israelites are going to come. They're going to wipe us out like they've wiped out everybody else. So we're going to do something about this. And this is where this picks up right here. Joshua 9 verses 3 through 8. I just want to read what happens here. Joshua 9, 3 through 8. So it says, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn patches, patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went up to Joshua in the camp of Gilgah and said to him and all the Israelites, we have come from a distant country, make a treaty with us. So they decided at this point that they were going to trick Israel. Now this is not the end of the story. We're going to come back and find out what happens a little bit. But right from the beginning, we get our first point. I'm going to hit on three high-level points from this story, from these two chapters. Because as we read on, now Israel is tricked, right? Israel thinks that these are people from a distant land who just want a peaceful treaty. And we read in verse 14, it says, the Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it with an oath. The Israelites come to find out now that these people are the neighboring next town, next kingdom, next settlement that they're going to take over, and they have been tricked. But they're going to stay to their oath. And we learn right away, right from the beginning, in this book of Joshua, that we need to be very careful not to rely on logic over the Lord. You see, I'm not saying that that we can't think logically. Okay, that's not what I'm saying here. 
<clears throat> and I'm not saying that the only way God ever operates is illogical. That's not what I'm saying. That's certainly not it. But what I am saying is we can become very accustomed and very uh, used to relying only on our own logic. You see, Joshua and his people, what did they do? They tasted. Oh, hmm, this seems okay. And they tasted the goods of the land. They saw with their eyes. They reasoned. <clears throat> this seems logical. This seems normal. This seems, oh yeah, this makes sense to us. This makes sense to us. So instead of inquiring of the Lord, they just went ahead and did their own thing. They did their own thing, and we will come to see that it got them in a mess. You see, from a mere human perspective, they thought this was a safe bet. And their assurance, this misperception, and their assurance in their perspective, it led them to perceive things that actually were not. You see, our perspective, if our perspective on things is off, if our perspective is wrong, if our perspective is misguided, so will our emotions, so will our thoughts, and certainly so will our actions. They will be misguided. They will be misdirected. They will not be walking in the way that God has called us to be because we are relying on our own perception. I want to share this really funny story with you. I came across this a couple years ago, and I just, this is a great story of misguided perception, okay? I'm gonna read it to you because it's so funny, like the language of it's so funny. Okay, I had gone to catch a train. This was April 1976 in Cambridge, UK. I was a bit early for the train. I had gotten the time of the train wrong. I went to get myself a newspaper to do the crossword. Got a cup of coffee and a packet of cookies. I went and sat at the table. Now I want you to picture this scene. It is very important that you get this very clear in your mind. Here's the table. Here's the newspaper. Here's my cup of coffee and my packet of cookies. There is a guy sitting opposite of me, perfectly ordinary guy, wearing a business suit, carrying a briefcase. It didn't look like he was going to do anything weird. And what he did was this. Suddenly, he leaned across the table, picked up the packet of cookies, tore it open, took one out, and ate it. I did what any red-blooded Englishman would do. I ignored it. <laughs> and I stared at the newspaper, took a sip of my coffee. I tried to do one of the clues and thought, what am I going to do? I tried very hard not to notice the fact that the packet was already mysteriously opened. So I leaned forward. I took a cookie out myself, and I thought, OK, that settled it. But it hadn't. Because a moment or two later, he did it again. He took another cookie. Having not mentioned it the first time, it was somehow even harder to raise the subject the second time around. We went through this whole packet like this. And when I say the whole packet, there were eight cookies. It felt like a lifetime. He took one, then I took one. He took one, then I took one. Finally, we got to the end of the packet. He stood up and walked away, and I breathed a sigh of relief and sat back. A moment or two later, my train was coming in, so I tossed back the rest of my coffee, stood up, picked up the newspaper, and underneath the newspaper was my packet of cookies. <laughs> His perspective on the situation was misguided. His perspective affected his attitude towards the people, didn't it? Towards this particular person. This guy's rude. What does he think he's doing? He's a thief. He's stealing from me. He was uncomfortable in this situation because what, what is this guy doing? His perspective was wrong, though. And it dictated how he felt. It dictated the level of his comfort in a situation. You see, our perspectives are just that. They're our perspectives. And the Israelites in this situation, they had a perspective on a situation that they just logically themselves contrived and they did not inquire of the Lord. You think that word is in there for a mistake? No. That is specifically in there to let us know, inquire of the Lord 
even when things might seem logical. God wants all of our decisions. God wants us to walk with him in step, in everything, even in the little things. God wants us to surrender and God wants us to submit. This is why we are called to not rely on our own understandings in Proverbs. It says, trust in the Lord, not with some of your heart, not only with the illogical things, not with the things you don't understand. It says, trust in the Lord with all, all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, Acknowledge him and he will make your path straight, meaning he will make things clear for you. Not easy, but clear. He will make a clear path for you. So we see this right at the beginning. They got it wrong. And I dare say we often get it wrong, don't we? We often jump to rash conclusions, rash decisions, knee-jerk reactions, Some of you are are more like peacemakers and responders. Like my husband is like a responder. So he's so like calm and he's so rational. I'm like a knee-jerk reaction kind of person. And so I've learned from him how to take a breath, how to assume the best of people, how to assume the best of a situation. People have done horrific things and said horrible things to my husband or about him. And he assumes the best. He doesn't jump to rash decisions. That's what we want to be like. We don't want to rely on our own ways. We want to heed this warning. Because if we don't, and this leads into my second point, our decisions have lasting repercussions. Remember I told you the story was not over? So what happened here is the Gibeonites made a pact with Joshua. And they became kind of a problem now for the Israelites. And so the Israelites are like, well, we can't leave them as a fortified nation with like weapons and all this kind of stuff. They could eventually rally and come after us. So what a lot of ruling nations then would do is they would strip them of any ability to be in combat. So it says, scripture says they made them woodcutters and water carriers. So a lot of nations then, uh, the Gibeonites probably paid tribute to Israel. They became the people who would supply them with things. But this left them very vulnerable because Gibeon was a very strategic city in the region. And so all of the surrounding kings, there were five surrounding kings that got together and they're like, all right, Gibeon's vulnerable. Gibeon's vulnerable. Let's go ahead and take Gibeon. We have the strategic point and then together, the five of us, our kingdoms, we will fight against Israel and we will be victorious. So these five kings rally and they decide to take over the Gibeonites. Guess who the Gibeonites call on? Israel. You're our keeper. You're our protector. Because Joshua and his people relied on their own logic, it left a huge mess for them. And this is what happens when we make decisions. They have lasting repercussions. And failure to ask the Lord for his guidance in this decision caused them to have to backtrack. So Israel was forging on ahead, moving towards the promised land. And what happened? No. You got to backtrack, march through the night, and now you have to fight fights and clean up messes that you were not intended to clean up. But you did it as a repercussion to a bad decision that you made. And this happens so much. Our bad decisions that we make Our decisions, well, actually good or bad, have lasting repercussions, don't they? And so many times when we fail to invite the Lord into things, we have to engage in unnecessary cleanup. This is such a human pattern of leaning on my own understanding, going my own way, and then when I hit a mess or I end up like stuck somewhere, I'm like, well, God, where are you? And he's like, Where am I? Where were you five steps ago? I was trying to get your attention and direct you down a different path. I was trying to get you to not say that or to not do that or to obey me here. You didn't obey me 10 steps ago. That's why you're here, Becca. Now you have a mess to clean up. And this is such a human pattern. What, what, just a more practical example. What do I mean by this? I look at Matthew 11. The words of Jesus are so beautiful, aren't they? They're, They're so beautiful. 
Matthew 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, not the world's. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, not from the world, not from your news channels, not from social media, not from your fr- Learn from me, Jesus says, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let me ask you this. When you're weary, is Jesus the first person you turn to? When we're weary from a difficult relationship, maybe, a marriage, a friendship, when we're weary from lack of direction or purpose in our life, when we're weary from a tough job or a financial situation, from a physical ailment, a health issue, is Jesus the first person you run to? You see, I think we go to a lot of things before we go to Jesus. We see that people go to substances, right? Oh, I'm just so stressed out on work. I'm so stressed. I can't wait to get home and have my glass of wine, have my glass of wine, have my glass of wine. I hear that all the time. That was me, actually, in a season of my life. I remember getting home. First thing I had to do was pour a glass of wine. And I'm telling you, after about three weeks, Jesus was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm having a glass of wine. No, I don't have anything against a glass of wine. But Jesus is like, I'm not talking about the wine. I'm talking about why you're going to the wine. I am the one that you're supposed to come to. I will give you rest. You are going to numb yourself with a glass of wine. You're going to rest for wine. Wine for rest. Not, not me. I've told you to come to me. Now, thank God for the Holy Spirit who leads us back into things, right? How do you think people fall into substance abuse? Because day after day after day after day, they make that choice. Substance abuse. Maybe we numb ourselves with mindless TV and social media. Now, I love watching my Netflix at night. But sometimes we just find ourselves in this pattern of hours and hours of numbing. Because we don't actually want to ask difficult questions and face the difficult things in our lives. Maybe God asking, where are we? Taking inventory of our lives. And so we just kind of push it away. We busy ourselves with scrolling and with clicking instead of going to Jesus. These are real things. How about shopping? I knew a gal actually who had a very, um, still, a very contentious relationship with her husband. And he worked a lot, and every time he had to work late, she'd go shopping, and she'd spend like $1,200. I know, I was like, that sounds nice. Uh, she just go, and it was almost like, every time she was angry at him, she just swiped the credit card. Like sticking it to her husband or something for not being home. I'm like, that's not going to solve anything. That's not going to solve anything. Jesus has come to me. And then we wonder, months or years down the road, how we got buried in such a mess. How are we ever going to get out from this giant pit that we've dug ourselves? Because our decisions have repercussions. And God has called us in his upside down kingdom. It is not like the world. God has called us to come to him first and to walk the way of obedience. That is the way of a kingdom that does not send you backwards like Joshua, but it propels you forward. And as you move forward in the kingdom of God, you bring the kingdom of God everywhere you go and you begin to see the work of God and it's exciting and it's life changing and it's motivating. Our decisions have repercussions if we would go to Jesus first and we wouldn't be like the Israelites and have to backtrack and clean up the mess. Our decisions have repercussions but you know and this is the last point that I want to point out tonight, today. I just think that in all of our messing up, you read these stories. So chapter nine is kind of about the mess that has to be cleaned up. Chapter 10 is about how gracious God is. God is so gracious. I hope you don't miss the goodness and the graciousness of God in the book of Joshua. He is amazing. We read right here that out of our failures, our failures, God can bring glory for himself. Isn't that amazing 
that even when we mess up, God, he can use all of our failures and he can still get the glory. We read in verse 10, Joshua chapter 10, verse 8, it says, the Lord said to Joshua, now remember, they're back, they've backtracked and they're fighting a battle now. The Lord said to Joshua, who did not listen to him and who did not inquire of him. Verse 8, do not be afraid. I have given your enemies into your hands and not one of them will be able to withstand you. God is so good. That's why we sang that song when we started the goodness of God. That God can use all of the things that we fail and when we just come back to him, he's like, I can accommodate. You know, actually, I, I was thinking about this. And I was thinking, that's kind of what the story of the Bible is, isn't it? Like from Genesis to Revelation, it's, his, it's us messing up all the time and God saying, I can still use you. I still want to use you and I can still make a way. And by the way, I will still be victorious. That's the whole story of the Bible. God accommodating his people and getting glory for it. And I think this is the story we need to tell more about the goodness of God, about the graciousness of God. God is so gracious. The world needs to hear this more. But unfortunately, I don't think they do. I don't necessarily know that that, like you, if you would um, interview people out on the street, that that's what they would say. Tell me what you think about God. That they'd say, God is so gracious. I, um, shortly after we got here, uh, I met some gals from the Clinton Township campus and they were brand new. They were at church for the first time that day. And you know those people who it's like, they've just, they had a super messed up life and they just discovered Jesus. They just gave their lives to Jesus. So they were like contagiously and irreverently giddy about Jesus. You know, that kind of like, like crazy excited for what God was doing in their lives. So <clears throat> we went out to lunch and then I met them at this restaurant and I get there and they're already talking to the waiter about church. They're like, oh my gosh, Kensington's our church and blah, 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 blah. And they were telling them all about the service. And, and then I sat down and they're like, this is our pastor's wife. This is Becca, blah, blah, blah. So, the, you know, the server's nice and he's just kind of listening to them. Every time he come back, they find they were like, you have to come to church with us. You, you've got to come to church with us. And, and he listened patiently for a while. And then finally he kind of looked at them after like the third time of being like, will you come to church with us on Sunday? He was like, well... Uh, you know, I mean, honestly, I'm the kind of person that if I walked into church, God would strike me with lightning. Or maybe I just like burn up coming through the door. And they laughed. And I was like crying. I was thinking, how did you come to the point where you thought that this was God? That God would strike you with lightning because you were seeking him? That's not the story that we read about. The prodigal son turns to come back home and God... The father runs to him with open arms. He doesn't punish him. He doesn't shame him. He covers his shame. And that's what Jesus does, does over and over and over again. And this is the story we need to tell about the goodness of God. What has God done? How has he been good to you? How has he been gracious to you? Tell the story of God's graciousness and God's goodness. I love how God describes himself to Moses. In Exodus 34, this is what he says about himself. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgetting wickedness, rebellious and sin. Do you know when he says that? He says that right after Moses comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and the children of Israel are worshiping a golden calf. After he has fed them every day, he has parted the Red Sea for them, he has freed them from Egypt, he has guided them through the desert, he has provided water for them, and they're worshiping a golden calf. And what does he say? Gracious and compassionate. I'm slow to anger. And I'm abounding in love. I forgive your wickedness. That's what he says. That's the God that Joshua worships. That's the God that we worship. That's the God that we sing these songs to. That's why I don't understand how we can sing worship songs and not just almost weep every time we do it. This is God. When we come with these hearts recognizing what God has done for us, the goodness of him, his graciousness, his compassion, his love, his accommodation. 
this is who he is. This is why he is so worthy of worship because he uses our failures and he can bring glory out of them. God also, and I'll just say this in closing, God can bring miracles out of our mistakes. You know, Joshua and the children of Israel, they backtracked, right? They backtracked. They were fighting a battle. And Joshua saw that they needed more time. So he raises his voice to the heavens. And he asked the Lord to stop the sun in the sky so that they'd have time for victory. And God does it. You know what God could have said? You got yourself into this mess. You figure it out. You battle through the night. You know what I see when God says, I'm going to hold the sun. I'm going to hold the sun in the sky so that you know I'm with you. Don't you ever forget it. Never again has that been written and done. And he says, I'm going to hold the sun in the sky so Israel knows I'm with them. I am the God who does not leave you or forsake you. I am the light of the world that lights every man. And I love you is the God who brings miracles out of our mistakes. And you know, I think sometimes we get to this point where we thought, man, I've really missed it. I've really blown it. What am I going to do now? When we put things in God's hands and we begin to right the wrongs, to make the course, walk in obedience, and take the um, responsibility for the decisions that we've made, and we begin to write those, God will bless those. And we will see things, God will show up in ways in our lives that we never expected him to do. Never expected him to reveal himself. Oh my goodness, I made this mistake, but now I know that God is this God. It's miracles. God makes miracles out of our mistakes if we just begin to surrender to him, and to walk in the obedience that he's called us to. In verse 20, it says, so Joshua and the Israelites defeated the Gibeonites completely. Completely. This is the God that we worship. This is the God that we read about. He is a God of total victory, abounding in graciousness and compassion. So rely on the Lord. Let's be women who rely on God in all things. Let's look to him and look to his kingdom first. Ask him to give us eyes for his kingdom. Let all you do, all your decisions be those made in obedience so that we can advance the kingdom of God and not have to walk backwards and waste time cleaning up messes. But know that when we mess up, that we serve a gracious God who runs to you with open arms and who can make glory for himself out of your failures, and that he can bring miracles out of your mistakes. This is such a good book. I'm so excited you guys have next week to be able to unpack a little bit more. Hang in there. Some of the, some of the stuff you're like, what the heck does this mean? Why is there significance in it? Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth. That's what Jesus said. I will send my spirit and it is my spirit that will guide you into truth. Let the Lord lead you into truth and reveal himself to you as you read his word, all right? Let's pray real quick as you guys go into small groups. Lord, I just thank you that you are a God who is with us, that you are a God who cares about us, not just the big things, but the small things too. And I pray, Lord, that you would just draw our hearts to you, that our eyes would be fixed upon you, And that even in the difficult decisions of obedience, Lord, that you would give us the strength and the perseverance to walk in the way that you have called us to walk. So that the world might know that we are followers of you by the way that we love you and love others. And so Jesus, I thank you for your word. I ask that you would um, just give us a revelation of Jesus in the book of Joshua that you would continue to reveal yourself to us, to minister your good character, your gracious heart to us as we pour into this text. Lord, we just love you and we surrender to you and we give you all that we are and all that we have. We said together in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Have a great rest of your morning.